Welcome to lab number four. Today's lab is kind of a continuation of the one we did last time. Last time we were doing epithelial tissues and we were doing simple epithelia. So remember in our introduction to epithelia last time that there can be simple epithelia which has one layer of cells or stratify which has multiple layers of cells. And today is all about stratified epithelia, which means we're gonna be talking about skin, and also we're gonna be talking about glands. Okay, we are diving right into the histology here. We are looking at some thick skin. This is all thick skin, this entire pick here is thick skin. Thick skin is found in two places. It is found on your palmar region, so that anterior part of your hand. Remember, no matter which way your hand is facing, the palmar is always anterior. And also on your plantar surfaces. Plantar is your bo the bottom of your foot. So definitely found on your palmar and plantar surfaces. That's where we find thick skin. Why do we have thick skin there? Well, the thickness is going to be beneficial because of the chances of abrasion and wear and tear. Okay, thick skin is going to live up to its name. Now, before we look at the stratified squamous epithelium, we got to know a little something about skin, okay? When I look at this whole picture here, I have this upper, more purple-ish, pink-ish region than this much lighter region down here. This upper region, which I've bracketed, is called the epidermis, okay? By the way, out here, this is open space, all right? This is open space right here. So the epidermis is the more superficial region of the skin. So this whole stretch right here is epidermis. Now, the epidermis is on top of another layer of connective tissue. So down here, that is called the dermis. All right, we're gonna look at both today, but we're really interested in the epidermis. We're interested in the epidermis because the whole epidermis, this whole area here, is made of stratified squamous epithelium. All right, look at all the nuclei. Look at all the purple nuclei. Just so many rows of them. So many rows of nuclei. Crazy. That means there's so many rows of cells. That means it's stratified. Now, if we're up here near the lumen, these cells here are all super squamous. These apical. Remember that word apical? The word apical meant closer to the surface. Okay next to the space. So the word apical describes these cells up here. These cells are totally flat, that's why they look like lines, all right? They're actually dead cells up here. They don't even have any nuclei, that's why you don't see the purpleness to them in the same regard. And <clears throat> with that combination, multi-layers, flat apical cells, that tells us this is stratified squamous epithelium. And we're going to look at this a little more in a little more detail. We're even going to name some parts of this as well. Okay. Said this was the dermis down here. Connective tissue. Check out how there's a lot fewer nuclei. A lot fewer nuclei. All right. I also want you to notice the waviness. The waviness here gives us more surface area. That means there's going to be a better connection between the epidermis and the dermis, which is going to allow it to be stronger to withstand greater forces, not to, to shear, and, shear and tear. All right. Let's look at some more. So we're looking at the same picture here. This is still thick skin. And remember, thick skin is palmer and plantar. We got our lumen up here. We got our wavy basal layer down here. Now, this is a lot of cells. The vast majority, not all of them, but 
you know, 90% plus of the cells in your epidermis are these cells called keratinocytes. Okay, why are they called keratinocytes? Well, the site part means cell, of course. The keratino part refers to a protein, and that protein is called keratin. Keratin is a tough, fibrous, waterproof protein. The cells in the epidermis are chock full of keratin in the apical layer. They're making keratin as we go a little deeper. And as we get to the, the deepest part of the epidermis, these cells eventually will make keratin. So all the keratinocytes are going to make a lot of keratin. Keratin gives this stratified squamous epithelium more strength, more structure, more sturdiness. And that's going to be better for protection, better for withstanding the physical and environmental insults that we put upon our skin. Now, there are other cells. There are melanocytes. I don't see any melanocytes in this particular picture. Melanocytes, of course, are going to make the pigment melanin, which contributes to the coloring of skin and is going to protect us from the damaging effects of UV radiation. By the way, what do you think is always happening to these keratinocytes up at the apical layer here? You're always shedding them. Right now, if your hand is on a table, a desk, wherever you're sitting, whatever you're touching, you are leaving skin cells there. Okay, which means the cells in the bottom here have always got to be dividing, have always got to be doing mitosis in order to replenish and replace the cells that are lost. All right, what we're going to do right now is we're actually going to name some parts of this stratified squamous epithelium, this epidermis here. In thick skin, there are five layers to the epidermis. We don't use the word layer when we're talking about epidermis. We use the word stratum. So thick skin is going to have five layers strata, the plural of, of stratum is strata. There are going to be five strata. Now, if you are paying attention and looking at things, you might go over here and notice and say, well, one, two, three, four. But I told you this is thick skin, and I just told you it had five layers. It does. One of them is just really hard to see, so didn't label it here. All right, there are five layers to thick skin. The deepest layer is just a single row, bum, 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 single row, single row of cells. That single row of cells that's the deepest layer is called the stratum basalia. Stratum basalia is the basal most layer, so that's basically what stratum basale means. It's a really mitotic layer. The cells down here are doing mitosis like crazy. Above it, so this region where it's, the nuclei and the cells are kind of light, especially as you get up a little more, before it gets dark again right here, before you get more purple again, that's called the stratum spinosum. You can actually see the desmosomes between cells if you zoom in, and it makes the cells look spiny or prickly, and so hence, stratum spinosum. Then, we have this layer where everything looks more purple, and we're looking more purple here because we're really ramping up the production of keratin. And this layer that looks more purple, the cells often have these little purple dots or granules, hence this is called the stratum granulosum. Now the last layer, the most superficial, the most apical layer is called the stratum corneum. It is the layer that we mentioned earlier that is made of dead cells just stuffed with, with keratin. 
Cornea means horn. Think like unicorn. So um, the reason this word is used is because well, you find keratin in things like the horns of a rhinoceros. So same same horn material. All right. We are looking at stratified squamous epithelium. The example we're looking at is in the epidermis of skin. This is thick skin, which is found in Palmer and plantar regions. And thick skin has five strata, four of which we see. And we don't see one of them. The one that we don't see is called the stratum lucidum. The one we do not see here is called the stratum lucidum. We will see it on the skin model that we're going to look at. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Let's see if we can keep on going. Like 10 minutes into this little video lab lecture. This one's like three hours long. Kidding. Of course. All right, got a skin model here. Skin model is another way to look at the epidermis. This is the epidermis right here. The epidermis, of course, is made of stratified squamous epithelium. Now, this particular region of the model that we have right here is made of thin skin. Remember, we found thick skin on the Palmer and plantar regions. Everywhere, everywhere else has thin skin. The epidermis is skinnier, plus there is the presence of hair. You have hair everywhere except your palmer and your plantar. Thin skin is a lot like thick, but it does have hair, and it only has four of those sublayers. It does not have the lucidum, so it only have the corneum, the granulosum, the spinosum, and the basalia. So this is the epidermis of thin skin. Okay, good. Let's look at some more stuff. Now we got thick skin. This is the epidermis of thick skin. Look how much thicker that stratum corneum is. So much thicker. The pointer is on the bottom layer of the epidermis. This is the bottom part of our stratified squamous epithelium, which we know is called the, whoops, I didn't mean to go do that. We know it's called the stratum basale. Notice the stratum basale is right next to the dermis, the connective tissue layer. In fact, this is all dermis right here underneath the epidermis. Now, you should remember, epidermis is an epithelial tissue. As such, it is definitely going to be avascular. It is going to lack blood vessels. But look how many blood vessels are in this superficial dermis here. That makes sense because we got to feed these dividing and developing cells in the epidermis, and they got no blood vessels of their own. Okay. Good. Let's not mess around. Let's keep going. If we go up a little bit more, we are now in the stratum spinosum of the epidermis of thick skin. So if I pointed to this on a test and said, what is this? You would say, Stratum spinosum of the epidermis, of thick skin, of the integumentary system, of the human body. I'm just kidding. You would just say stratum spinosum. Unless I asked you what tissue it was, if I said name the, the layer versus name the tissue, those are two totally different questions. Name the layers, well, stratum spinosum. Name the tissue, different questions, the, different question. That tissue there is stratified squamous. All right. Now we're pointing at this little darker, more granular layer, more granular, stratum granulosum. Now, this is thick skin, so it has five layers. We're actually going to see that missing layer that we didn't see in the microscopy earlier. This is the stratum lucidum right here. Often hard to see or not apparent in the microscopic view, 
but we got it here on the model. That is the stratum lucidum. And then this big old layer of dead, flattened, keratin-filled, nucleus-lacking cells is the stratum corneum. Fantastic. Okay, with that, we are pretty much done with the stratified squamous epithelium of the epidermis. And so, because we have a skin model handy here, we kind of have to go through the other major components of the skin. I mentioned to you earlier that under the epidermis, here's epidermis, deep to the epidermis, this layer here, before you get down to the fat, this is all fat down here, before you get down to the fat, this layer here is the dermis. The dermis has basically two parts. If I draw a line like that, above my line, so right in here where the tip of the pointer is, where my cursor is dancing, that is called the papillary layer of the dermis. It's going to contain this tissue called areolar connective tissue. We are going to meet that in the very next lab, in fact. Okay? So this is called the papillary layer. The word papillary, this word papillary, okay, the word papillary means bumpy. So the dermis has these bumps. We actually saw them earlier, earlier. I'm going to backtrack for a second. Bear with me, bear with me. Remember this? Remember this? We said we got this waviness. Look at this bump right here. Look at this bump. This upward projection. This is papillary dermis here. That's the bump to it. It's the bumpiness. And the bumps in the dermis, they are called dermal papillae. So this little like upward projection right here, this upward projection right here, this guy, uh, those are called dermal papillae. Literally means skin bumps. And as we said before, it's going to create a strong connection, an interlocking between the dermis and the epidermis so they don't separate. Sometimes they do, and that's when layers of your epidermis and dermis separate, that's when you can get a blister. All right. Got the papillary dermis. If we strip away the epidermis, this is the papillary dermis right here. Look at all those blood vessels in it to feed the overlying epidermis. So there's the papillary dermis. And we can see all of these bumps. These bumps, they are all dermal papillae. The plural is papillae. The singular is papilla. Anchoring, interlocking the dermis and the epidermis. All right, what else can we see in skin? There's more. The lower layer, the deeper the deeper layer. Remember I drew a line, said above it was the papillary dermis, the region below it, deeper to it, before we get down to the fat here, that is called the reticular layer of the dermis. It's going to have a type of connective tissue called dense irregular. We're going to meet that part later on, that later on in the next lab. This is the strongest, the most strongest of part of the skin. It gives it really, um, gives it a lot of strength. How many times can I use the word strong? Okay, awesome. Let's clear all that. What else can we see in the skin? We can see the fatty layer down below. The fatty layer down below is called the hypodermis. Hypodermis literally means under the skin. So it is technically not part of the skin. It's deep to it. It's got adipose tissue, which is our better word for fat tissue. We'll actually look at adipose tissue in the next lab. Adipose tissue under the skin is super important for shock absorption. 
also for thermal insulation, so keeping the heat your body is generating actually inside your body. And why would you want to do that? Well, to maintain temperature. In other words, to maintain homeostasis. Okay. What else can we see in the skin? We got a sweat gland here. This is a sweat gland called a marocrine sweat gland. That white spherical thing there, you can see his duct coming up. This is a marocrine sweat gland. Now, marocrine sweat glands are all over your body. Millions of them. They are making sweat. Obviously, it's a sweat gland. It makes sweat. They make a very watery sweat. The water of in sweat is going to travel from this coiled duct up, 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 up. By the way, the word marocrine means that the sweat is secreted by exocytosis. If you've listened to the cells, membranes, and transports lecture, you know about exocytosis. If you haven't listened to it, well, you should. Okay. Um. When the water gets to the surface, so we got water on the surface here. Water's right there. The water and sweat, of course, is a liquid. And what does that liquid do? But it turns into a gas. And that process of evaporation steals heat from your body and helps reduce body temperature. If it's really humid outside, you sweat, but the evaporation doesn't occur and you feel even hotter. It's harder to stay cool. Okay. Awesome. That's our marocrine sweat gland. Millions of them over the body. Well, what else do we have in the skin model here? We have another sweat gland. This big yellow sweat gland here is called an apocrine sweat gland. Apocrine sweat gland, not found all over the body, okay? Not found all over the body. Found basically in a few hairy regions, axillary, anal, and pubic areas, okay? The apocrine sweat glands are a different kind of, make a different kind of sweat. Their sweat is going to contain more nutrients, Bad thing about this is that bacteria are going to eat those nutrients. Bacteria are going to make waste products, and those waste products are going to be stinky on occasion. Um, we basically have these glands because our animal ancestors did. That's what the word vestigial means. It's something that we have, but we no longer use it. We used it once. You know, other animals use these types of glands to mark their territories, to attract mates. We're not rubbing armpit sweat on the outside of our house to mark it as, you know, our territory. We're not trying to let members of the opposite sex know that it is breeding time through these secretions and the odors emanating from them. But we still got them. Okay, on that note... Let's keep moving and see what else we can see in this skin model. Ooh, we got another gland here. This is a gland called a sebaceous gland. They are found in thin skin. Now, they're found in thin skin because they're associated with hair. Sebaceous glands are always associated with hair. Sebaceous glands make this oily secretion called sebum which helps to moisturize your skin. I know your skin gets dry sometimes, but it would get so much drier if you didn't have sebaceous glands. Can you think of two regions on your body that do not have sebaceous glands? Shout it out. Well, if sebaceous glands are found in thin skin, that means they're not found in thick skin, which means we're going to not find them on the Palmer and Plantar regions, the PNPs. All right. With that notion, 
Anything else? Yeah. There's a muscle right there. That muscle right there. That is a muscle called an arector pili. Arector pili literally means straightener of hair. So what this muscle does, when it contracts, it makes the hair stand up. This is what happens when we're getting goosebumps. This is another vestigial structure. In furrier mammals, making the hair stand up traps more air, which keeps you warmer. That's why you get goosebumps when it's cold. Plus, making the hair stand up can make a furry mammal look bigger, more ferocious as a predator or as a prey. That's why we get goosebumps when we're scared. We don't look particularly scary, hopefully, when we get goosebumps. But yeah, another residual structure. Awesome. With that, we are done with the skin. I know we're doing stratified epithelium, and we did epidermis, and that took us down a rabbit hole of skin structures that we just kind of had to do. Now we're going to do another stratified epithelium. I've bracketed it here in red. This is a slide from the urinary bladder. Here is the lumen of the urinary bladder right there. So the epithelial tissue is lining the lumen as epithelial tissues do. Multi-layered, look at all those nuclei. If you think it reminds you of pseudostratified, notice you do not see any cilia right here. This epithelium, it is a stratified epithelium, but it gets a special name. It is called transitional epithelium. And that name reflects its ability to change shape. When the I mean, the purpose of the urinary bladder is to fill up and store urine, so we don't have to pee as often. And this epithelium can stretch the apical cells, and they're called umbrella cells, are more dome-shaped when the bladder is empty and relaxed, and then they flatten out as the bladder fills up with urine, as it becomes more and more distended. So this is transitional epithelium. We only find this epithelium in the urinary system. It's in the urinary bladder, it's in the ureters, it's in the urethra, a little bit in your kidneys as well. It's not found in any other system, which is pretty neat. Okay, cool. That's transitional epithelium. That didn't take too long at all. Good news. There's only one more stratified epithelia we got to do. And we're looking at it right here. This is a transverse section of the duct of a sweat gland. I just crossed it out. I meant to underline it. My bad. There we go. If I go back for a second, in fact, if I go back, oh, any one of these will do. Here's a merocrine sweat gland. Imagine we cut it. Ah, here we go. Imagine we cut it like that. Slicey slice. That's transverse because we're going perpendicular to the long axis of the duct. And that's what we would get. Obviously, this is our lumen right here. And when we look at the cells lining it, we see more than one layer of nuclei. So we know it is stratified. Looks nothing like the skin. Looks nothing like the pseudostratified ciliated epithelium we had in the trachea. Don't see the umbrella cells. Plus, it's, got, it's a whole tube here, like we saw in the urinary bladder. This is stratified cuboidal. Stratified because of the multi-layers, cuboidal because most of our cells are going to be a roundish, squarish shape. Awesome. That is so good. Ah. And with that, we are done, actually. Ah, this is my last slide. Yay, we're done lab number two. Solid 30 minutes talking about it. Not too bad. Watch it once, watch it twice, watch it thrice. Hit me up with your questions. Email is always the best way. Come by to the Blackboard office hours. Talk to me there. Yeah. 
Hope you guys are doing okay getting through this class. Take care. Bye-bye.